Amazing grace. You know, they gave me, they always allow me into the hanging chambers. Then when they bring down the body, they put the body on a stretcher. I would close her eyes in death and um, they usually have their hands uh, handcuffed at the back and I had put a rosary. God is so present there. In that one moment, I feel, I know when I hear the lever and they pull it and they fall through the tap, I don't feel afraid. I just feel peace. And I know that Mother Mary and Jesus is there. And they have been there to receive them into heaven. This is a wonderful thing of my faith. I come from a very devoted family. My parents were from Kerala, and the faith was instilled in us from a very young age. At the age of six, I was already going for mass. Like there were, at that time, probably six of us in the family. Actually, we are 10. And my mum, every morning, she would wake us up. She'd wake the girls up in one room. Then she'd go over to the boys' room to wake them up. Then when she came back, the girls went back into bed. So she did this until we were all wide awake. And she took us to Mass every morning. Now that is something, when I look back, that the Mass, the Eucharist, became so much a part of my life. After a while, my mom didn't have to wake me up, and it became a part of my life. And I feel that my love for the Eucharist starts from that moment every morning and sometimes in the beginning she had to bribe us before we go to school we have we go to mass and she say okay i'll take you to the coffee shop nearby and i will have a lovely breakfast but my mom knew that we needed nourishment for the body as well as nourishment for the soul so i grew up loving the eucharist and i think that's where my vocation began, the very tiny seed was sown. My dad, with 10 of us, each one of us had his special love. And every time he came home from the office, um, we would be playing in the back lane. And um, when we see, we know the, what time the bus arrived. And from the corner at the end of the back lane, we would see him coming. He was secretary to the Chief Justice of Singapore. So he had this uniform, he was always dressed in white. And we would see him coming. And all of us, maybe there would be six of us playing there, we would just run into his arms. Now that joy is something that is, is, is there with you forever. He retired when I decided to enter the convent. My sister had already entered, my eldest sister, a year before me. There was never any kind of uh, negative attitude of my parents. Christmas seemed to be a bigger feast than Easter. And we went on the bus, and often people said, look at them, see how nicely they are dressed. And my mother would sit there in the bus and she would be beaming. 
with looking at us. So the first, that's going to mass, midnight mass. After a while, as we grow older, we join the choir, the girls. The boys became altar service. So after that, then we went to mass at Novena Church. So every midnight mass, we were there in the choir singing. And uh, when we came home, we had our Christmas, uh, kind of Christmas supper together. And um, the joy of just celebrating the birth of Jesus. And of course, the, we, we gathered together to prepare the crib. That was something that was the main thing in the house. And the Christmas tree. You know, nowadays Christmas trees come all with lights already decorated, right? But in our time, uh, decorating the Christmas tree was a family affair. The children gathered around, put things on the tree and whatever you wanted to, and the parents were there watching us. It was a real family affair. And there was so much joy. But we don't see that now. Of course, things have moved. It's a different world now. But those are my memories of Christmas. And I can remember the morning I told him, you know, I used to teach in the convent of the Good Shepherd Sisters, the, the, the kindergarten. And I used to bring my brother and sister to the kindergarten, the younger ones. And on that morning, uh, 1956, he, was, he always reads the paper in the morning. And uh, he, had, he had just resigned from his job because his eyes were getting bad. And I said to him, Dad, I'm going to the convent. And he said, yes, yes. He thought, go. He thought that I was saying, I'm going to school with the two. And I stopped. And I said, Dad, I'm going to enter the convent to become a sister. And he slowly put his paper down and he looked at me. And there was no, you know, this is a, a, a man who had lost his job. He still had children to feed. My two brothers were studying in England. And he just looked at me and said, is that what you really want? And I had just finished my, uh, what we call old levels here, senior Cambridge, just out of school. And he said, you know, I can give you a tertiary education. Don't you want to wait for that? I said, no, no, no. If I wait, I will lose my vocation. Imagine at 18, I was telling him this. And he gave me his full blessing. With my mother, there was total giving. Now, I must say that there were difficulties. My first few weeks in the convent, I wanted to go home. I came from a very loving, happy family. I miss them. And I know that Christmas, I won the very first Christmas, I sat in the chapel. And I cried and cried and cried. And I didn't know my companion was also crying. We missed home. We missed our family, which is a good sign, I think. And in those days, the family visited to you only once a month. And we look forward to this. And I, I, yet, I, I could ask myself, what do you want? Whom do you want to serve? But it was wonderful that letting go, it was a gradual letting go. And you know, Jesus said, you give up your father, your mother, and you, you, you gain a hundredfold, which is true. That's his promise. He gives us a hundredfold. I mean, it was a very joyful occasion. My parents were there for my first profession. My father was still alive. It was a joy for him. He really, you could see, I have a photograph of him smiling away. Both my mom and dad were so happy.
But on that day, I received uh, my first, what we call, obedience. I was, I got the news that I was to be sent to Indonesia. And you know what happened in Indonesia, right? Uh, with the confrontation, all communication was cut off. And so I didn't have communication with my family for some time, for a few years. I was there for, uh, from 1959 to 62. It was a difficult place to live in because um, food was not, you know, in Singapore you get everything you want. Over there, it was scarce. But I loved the work, I loved the children. I loved the girls that I was working for. These were difficult children, difficult teenagers. And I, that's what I wanted to do. And here was I working for them. I was happy working for them. And after, when I came back from Indonesia, I was in different ministries in Singapore. I was, a, I was teaching actually in the, my first profession was teaching. I was a teacher in primary one in Marymount Convent School. And then I decided one day when I felt that it was time for me to do something, not just looking after the teenagers. Now, if you ask me when this call to the prisoners came, I'd still say in my childhood. You know, during the war, my father and mother took us to Malacca. We travelled to Malacca and we lived on an estate. I remember my dad, he was concerned about our education and we couldn't go to school. So every morning we had to wait a long time for breakfast because, the, you know, it just the firewood, my mother had to cook it and it was so slow. So while waiting for breakfast, my father had this idea that he would teach us phonetics so that we would learn to speak well. So he had this little book with little verses. And I sit there and listen to my two brothers, to my brother and my sister, reciting this passage from this phonetic book. And what was the passage? I commit you to Sing Sing Prison, there to be hanged, drawn, and quartered. Now, this is English, right? And I said, my brother said, and every word had to be pronounced. My father, would, we had a long dining table. My father would sit at one end, and, the, and my brother and sister would stand at the other end and recite this until it was perfect. And I, was, I used to sit there down in the, near the table and listen to this. And at six years old, I didn't like the passage. And you know, I was a strong-willed little child. And I said, no, I'm not going to recite that when it comes to my turn. When I was old enough, six, seven, my father said, now it's your turn. So when I came up there, he thought I was going to recite this passage. I stood up a tall little to my full height and I recited the Hail Holy Queen. Hail Holy Queen, Mother of Mercy, our life, our sweetness, and our hope. My father was so stunned, so proud of me. He said, I was not yet seven. She can recite the whole Hail Holy Queen all by heart. He was so thrilled. He forgot about Sing Sing Prison. But to me, God called me at that moment. At the age of six, prison, hanged, these two words were there. I never knew at age of 36, I would be walking with death row.
I was a teacher and a counsellor. So after I, Vatican II, where the invitation was to open the windows, go out and see what you can do. And the need to help ex-drug offenders was something that came up in Singapore. So uh, two priests and myself, we attended the course. We decided that um, we would go for this and start prison work. I mean, when I look back, it is, it, it is a good shepherd work. So that's how we started, the, uh, going out to uh, visit drug offenders, and then we visited the prisons as well, and the rehabilitation centers. And some of the cases were really very sad because they kept going back, you know, in and out of prison. And that's how I started then to work with these uh, prisoners in the, in the penal section. And I began, there were four of us, we started. And gradually I decided we need to have an organization. And we started the Roman Catholic Prison Ministry. Our mission was to be the compassionate love of God, of the Father, for these people. That was our main aim, our goal, to bring the mercy of God into the prisons. And then that case, the most bizarre case of uh, the Adrian Lim case, I, I'm sure you've read it, you can read it on Google to have a better understanding. And you see God's ways. The woman involved in that case was my pupil. <laughs> so I cannot say God was not calling me. She was my pupil. I knew her so well. I knew she was in our Marymount Vocational Center. She was such a good girl and she became a murderess. It was just so sad. Now, when I heard that she was this woman who had murdered the two children, all of us, the sisters, were so shocked. And, you know, our whole being kind of just wanted to, to help her because we knew her so well, we knew her family so well. So there was a case then, I was connected more to the family first. I looked after her in our home. She was a good girl. But what happened was when her grandmother died, she just lost all control and she went into prostitution with bad friends and met this medium, Adrian Lim, and he just twisted her around his finger and she became his slave. She and another woman. I, when I heard that she was going to be hanged, I immediately sat down and wrote to the director of prisons and I wanted to see her because she was my... And my letter must have touched him because he replied, he said, you can certainly see her, but the prisoner must say she wants to see you. So I wrote to her, sent her a beautiful picture of the Sacred Heart of Jesus with those eyes looking at her. My heart really went out to her. I, I kind of entered into her pain also, being my pupil and being close to me. I couldn't, I said, I must see her. I want to see her. I just want to tell her, okay, you have done these things, but God still loves you. And I wrote that letter. And only six months later, I got a reply and I picked up the, the, the letter, the envelope was a brown envelope, I still remember the prison envelope and uh, I only looked 
at the sender, and it was your black sheep, Catherine. And I immediately knew who it was. And she had written, and she said her first words were, how can you love me when I have done such bad things? And she said, I'm so grateful, and I would like you to come and see me. So that gave the, the director permission, gave him, once the prisoner says he wants to see, then you're allowed to go in. So then I started seeing her. They knew they were going to get the death sentence, but throughout the trial, they were seven years in prison. And for seven years, I visited her every week. And she finally, the day came and she said, I want to ask for forgiveness not only from God in confession, but from everyone that I have hurt. And so her story began of conversion. And that was the greatest joy for me that day when she said, Sister, I want... It was, I went to visit her with a priest, Father Doro. So we regularly went until she said, Father, I'm ready for confession. And she made her confession. And once she made her peace with God, total change. She was a different person. And, and you know, that is why I wonder, you know, for 20 years, I have my group praying. Every Wednesday, we come together before the Blessed Sacrament. Praying, asking God, abolish death penalty in our country. Because we, I don't support the death. I respect their, my laws. I love Singapore. And I respect the laws of my government. And I ask the Lord, why is it you haven't answered our prayers? We are praying so hard. this, when you can experience a, a prisoner, a murderer who has broken the law, someone who has broken the law, when you can experience and see that intimate moment, like the prodigal son, right? When he came to his senses, what does he say? I can go back to my father. He, it was there, the picture of that father who didn't scold him, who didn't, you know, who sold everything, who gave him his inheritance. That, that picture of the father is there. And when a prisoner can say, I want that forgiveness from God. That's, I think that is why God waits. He doesn't abolish it. He gives us the opportunity to go in and bring them back to him. I visited Catherine every week. We prayed, she sang hymns with me. And her companion, who was the one that murdered the children together with her in the Adrian Lim case, used to listen. And um, after I left, Catherine would talk to her about Jesus. And eventually, she asked to see me on a regular basis and Father Doro. And she was given the permission to do so. When a prisoner asks for anything, especially in death row, they are, they are really listened to and given whatever they need. So she asked to be a Catholic and they allowed her to be baptized. She was baptized in death row. I had one case. The Filipino maid who murdered her companion. She then was in prison and I visited her every week. Now she couldn't speak English. 
But she learned English by talking to me and talking over. They can talk to one another from the, you know, they can shout to each other. They, she learned it from the other two girls. And with me, she learned to read the Bible. And um, gradually, when the time came for her appeal, it was rejected. And she was very angry with God. She's a Catholic. She didn't want to see me. She didn't want to see anybody. She didn't want to receive Jesus. I used to bring Holy Communion every day, the Eucharist, the power of the Eucharist every day, but she said she didn't want. She just sat in a cell with her back to the wall. I still came. Every day I came, I sat there in front of her cell. She wouldn't talk to me, but I spent time there praying and telling her, you know, God still loves you no matter what. She was so angry with God. So I got, see, the power of our Blessed Mother. I used to give the novena of Our Lady of Perpetual Succor in the parish of Holy Family Church. And so I said to them, look, I need you to pray. There is this prisoner in death row. Will you offer all your prayers at the novena session that I was giving? Pray for her, uh, 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 to pray for, you know, that, that this Filipino girl, that she would really ask God's forgiveness and not be angry with him. So they started to pray for her. Her name was Flo. I said, pray for her that she will change and God will give her the grace to change. And they did. And uh, about two weeks later, I went as I did every week and I sat there. And this time when I came in, she was all bumbling and happy and joyful. I said, what happened? I said, sit down, sit down, sit down I tell you. And she said, Mother Mary came to my cell. I said, yes, she did? Yes. So I was, I was done too. And I said, how was she dressed? She said she was in a white dress with a blue sash. So that's true, right? Mother Mary is dressed that way. So I said, what did she say to you? She said to me, Flo, don't be afraid. I am with you. So I was, I believed, I felt even the presence of Mother Mary because she was so happy, she was so joyful. She was no longer angry with God. And that was enough for her to change. And from the moment of that to her death, there was only joy in her heart. And she went peacefully to her death. her children. She had a pair of twins. They came over, but she said to them, she sent them back before the day before she was hanged, because there was so much publicity. And I was with her right up to the end. And when she died, when she was hanged, she was very peaceful. Um, when, you know, they gave me, they always allow me into the hanging chambers and I can sit there and wait while the hanging goes on. Then when they bring down the body, they put the body on a stretcher. And I promised her I would close her eyes in death and um, they usually have their hands uh, handcuffed at the back, and I had put a rosary. God is so present there. In that one moment, I feel, I know when I hear the lever, and they pull it, and they fall through the tap, I don't see it. But I know as I'm praying there, 
that they've gone to God. When I hear that lever, I don't feel afraid. I just feel peace. And I know that Mother Mary and Jesus is there. And they have been there to receive them into heaven. Now, this is a wonderful thing of my faith, you know. One of the most beautiful cases was the young man, only 25, who carried drugs from, uh, and was caught, all right? So he had the death penalty. Now, um, he lost his appeal. He was very disappointed, very upset again. I was visiting him, but not so regularly, you know. One day he heard me, he was so angry also after his appeal was rejected. You know, felt down, felt depressed. And uh, it, the, during the case, his mother stayed, came in from Australia and the lawyer, they stayed with us. So we knew her very well. Right? And so he was very despondent. Then one day, he heard I was visiting another prisoner. Now, in the old days, the two blocks, the male, the, the blocks for the male prisoners and the block for the female were kind of side by side and they could hear, you know. So he heard me singing a hymn to Our Lady that, that the, you know, the one as I kneel before thee, as I bow my head in prayer. Now it touched him so much. And he said, I want to see that sister. And fill me with your And I want to become a Catholic. So that was again our lady's doing. His mother was a Buddhist but she didn't object. So he was baptized and he, he went so joyfully to his death, almost dancing up the, to the gallows. A young man, only 25. The prison officers are specially trained for death row. They are specially trained how to treat the, the, the prisoner. So they, they kind of get a relationship with the prisoner. Now the superintendent was a young man, very lovely person, not even, I mean, no religion or anything, just a very good person, young. And um, on the day of the hanging, you know, normally uh, uh, we are there praying and the cells are, the others are there and they can listen, they can hear what's happening, but they are in their cells. And they are all with the prisoner. So they were all singing the Amazing Grace in different languages. <laughs> the ones in Chinese were singing in Mandarin. And he was going to his, uh, to the, and he asked me, me for a nice, like a nice coat, you know, which I made for him. And he wore that. And usually they walk up to the uh, gallows. Then they turn the corner and they go up the trap door. Um, so the, the superintendent has to be there to, to, to receive them and walk with them. Now this superintendent was there and as this, this inmate walked, towards him. We were all singing. You know, that superintendent comes forward and he embraces him, which is so unusual. So unusual. And yet everybody feels. To me, it's like the Lord, like God himself, embracing this young man. And it was like a son to him. He embraced him and then he turned around and led him to the hanging chambers. You, you just, you can't help but 
feeling God's presence there. And we have a mass. Now, the mass is the thing that makes them happy because they prepare for the mass together. You know, they choose the hymns, we have the readings, and what is beautiful, even those who are not Catholics but have had the permission to join our Catholic services, they also would want to go to confession. And sometimes fathers say, you don't need to come. No, I want to come. I want to get peace. Now, they're already so beautiful. You know, you don't have to be a Catholic to, to ask God for forgiveness. So, and they look forward to having that before the Mass, those who want Father is available. And we, the counsellors, make the Mass as joyful as we can. We have a time for singing the carols. We teach them that at Christmas. They always miss their families. And I think another very beautiful thing that happens with me, as a Good Shepherd sister, I have my community. While I am walking with a death row inmate, my community is praying for me at home. And it's the most beautiful thing. And in some cases, they were especially that Australian drug trafficker, because his mother and brother were in town. They were there at the convent in the chapel Pray with the lawyers, praying for me and for that for the inmate. Now that that's something that gives you the strength. You forget yourself. So far, I haven't had any one of these uh, inmates not wanting to be at peace and to be at. At, at, you know, with God, knowing they are going to go to their death. I haven't met anyone. They've all, and that's because of our faith and our religion. We have all those helps to help us to let go of our lives and go back to God. I think it's, uh, I look forward to celebrating Christmas. For me, it's always a joyful time when I come to the crib and I can kneel there and adore Jesus, this little babe, it fills my heart with a lot of joy. Although at the back of my mind, I know, as some of the prisoners will tell me, yeah, sister, that baby one day will die on the cross. But for the moment, let's enjoy this baby. Sometimes they say that. It's Christmas, we'll enjoy his birth. I am a Good Shepherd sister. I belong to a congregation that is universal. And I've been a religious sister for the past 66 years. And I have no regrets. It has been a joy for me to truly believe that the Lord called me he has been faithful to me, but I, I have to say, 60 years of my life have been a years of, oh, there have been difficulties, but the joy of living for Him and for His people is far more rewarding than anything else. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let us rejoice with Him. I, I must get the words. Let every heart prepare Him room. Heaven and angels sing, and heaven and angels sing, and heaven and heaven. Angels sing. I don't have the words correct. <laughs>
Are you searching for fulfillment? <laughs> Discover true happiness. Stay tuned to Shalom World. <laughs>